Oh, good job. Hello, this is uh, Friday, June 5th. This is the Morning Brushback. I am your co-host, Dan Blewett. We've got a great guest today. We also have a our co-host with some audio video difficulties. Bobby, how you doing, man? I'm, I'm hanging in there. How do I, if I sound all right, that's why everyone tunes in, obviously, the, the soothing nature of my voice. So we're good. It's a, it's a Bobby-centric show. He's joining us live from like the Dunkin' Donuts parking lot or something. Um, rough day for him. Thanks. But we have a great guest. Amanda Smith is here. Amanda, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on, guys. You're welcome. Thanks for being here. Uh, so Amanda and I have met recently. She's organizing an awesome uh, softball summit. And she's also a former D1, D2 softball player and a current coach. And what would you say your biggest uh, area of emphasis is on your personal coaching? What, what, what sector of softball is your biggest thing? Pitching. So I was a pitcher, D1, uh, D2, as well as a third baseman, but I was a utility player. So I got to play everything. Um, but pitching is my main focus, but I'm also doing hitting and catching. So would you throw the ball and then sprint down there real fast and catch it as a kid? No. <laughs> you, so no, you I work would. for, you worked for NASA. Have you thought of developing this technology where you could throw a teleport and then catch it and then teleport Oh man, back. teleportation would be like the ultimate, right? I just, if, if only, or time travel, right? Mm, but mm, mm. <laughs> no, I haven't come up with that. Uh, I, I actually, I tortured my catchers. I threw, I was one of the fastest pitchers in the world at one time. And I, I definitely still can hurt girls' hands when they catch me. So I, I don't, I would never want to catch me. That's pretty much what it boils down to. So I would never want to try and throw it and then go catch it from, from me at least. Okay. So you throw hot lava, you throw balls of fire. 72 death yeah. missiles okay. exactly i topped out at 72 miles per hour on on the radar i'm you know that's pretty fast <laughs> yeah it's not slow that's that's for sure so uh today we're going to cover a bunch of topics if you're joining us live on youtube or twitter hello um the uh the the discussion is open i suppose so if you want to leave a comment or if you have a question for Amanda or any of us, feel free to throw it into Twitter, Periscope, or YouTube, and we will uh, get it answered. So, Amanda, you work for, I want to jump to the end of your college career, and we'll go back. We'll, but we're going to have this basically like a time machine, chrono, just extremely not chronological order today. But, so let's go to the end of your college career. Yep. You went to work for NASA. Yes. So about six months after I graduated college, which took me an extra long time to do, uh, I went and worked for Lockheed Martin, actually, who had the Orion contract, NASA's Orion vehicle, which is sitting over my shoulder here. Um, I worked for them for about eight and a half years, helped them develop vehicles that are actually going to be launching hopefully next year. And then uh, they just started building the last vehicle that I got to touch, which is the first vehicle that they'll put humans on. So wait, so the first vehicle, what's different about this vehicle that they're going to, what do you mean put humans on? So we've launched a couple of vehicles. So the first vehicle that I worked on was called PA-1 pad abort one and we were out in the new mexico white sands desert and we basically turned the vehicle into a ginormous lawn dart because we were we were testing the pad abort which means how fast can we get the astronauts away from the rocket in case the rocket decides it wants to blow up Got so it. a pad abort and then uh the next vehicle that i worked on was ascent abort which is the same thing but we are actually flying in the air and then the next vehicle, so there's a bunch of test vehicles that you have to, to develop out before you actually put humans on board. The next vehicle was EFT-1. Uh, that one went out of Earth's orbit and then back in. So that was my first space vehicle. And then uh, EM-1, which is Artemis-2, I believe. It, that one is scheduled to launch in 2021. 
Uh, they keep pushing the date back a little bit because the rocket's not ready yet. And then the one that they just started developing, which is the one that actually like cutting hardware for it. Um, that one goes, that one's Artemis three, and that one's not scheduled until I believe 2025, but that one's the first one that'll have humans on. So I feel like I've got this little space legacy going on at this point. I'll get to go to the launches and celebrate things that I worked on years ago at this point. That's crazy. Yeah. So obviously the SpaceX thing just happened Mm -hmm. and went off without a hitch, which is awesome. Yes, thank um, God. And as we were talking off camera, I felt like it was kind of an under the radar event because I live under a rock, sort of. And I, it was possible that I could have not known about this if certain people in my life didn't tell me. Yeah. But I mean, what a crazy thing that it's been like a decade since we put anyone into space and now we're doing it again. And how do you feel about the private sector versus NASA doing it themselves? <laughs> I have a lot of opinions about that. <laughs> yes, yes, please. <laughs> oh, Bob, you're here. Oh, hello. Nice of you Sorry. to join us. I'm trying. I just put myself on mute just to drown out the car noises driving past me. But I am. Yeah, I very mean, you're fascinated. you're your best self when you're muted. So I support. I that. am very fascinated with the with the space stuff. And I would. I would do we are we talking about softball today? Because I can run on aliens. For we are going to talk about softball, but we, we're we starting exciting before we get slightly less exciting. <laughs> so, um. It's it's interesting coming from so Lockheed Martin is technically the private sector, right? But we were building a vehicle for NASA. NASA's always and probably will always be responsible for putting humans in space. That's their job. They're the ones who prepare the astronauts. They own the astronauts, if you will. So even with SpaceX, NASA owns the property that the the uh, launch happened on. The astronauts are NASA's astronauts. So NASA is always going to be intertwined with, with the aerospace community. I don't know that there's any way around that. I think the biggest, the biggest division, what you, you'll see with a NASA-owned product versus a private sector-owned product is the amount of paperwork and the paper trail that goes along with it. The private sector can move faster because NASA's not constantly on top of every little yeah. thing going on, right? And NASA has to be that way because they're a government entity and they're spending our money, our money being all of the people paying for those things. So yeah, I built that spaceship that just went off or in part of it. Did you know that? I trained those astronauts. Did you know that? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, man. Uh, so, I mean... The, NASA will always have their hands in that that portion of it, uh, but the private sector, I mean, yes, man. I now own, I'm part owner of an aerospace company. I'm part of the private sector now, and it without NASA's oversight, I can actually move a boatload faster than what I did on the Orion program. The Orion program, everything had to be approved. We were constantly going to board meetings, and I mean... If you've ever worked in the corporate world, you know meetings are a part of your job. But Mm -hmm. when you work with NASA, meetings are a part of every minute of every day. And you have to come into work before meetings start with NASA and stay after meetings end with NASA. And so I would be coming in. I usually came in late, but a lot of people would come in really early (laughs) before 9 a.m., Uh, And they wouldn't leave until easily after 6 p.m. So it's it's a nice long day working with NASA, sitting in meetings, and you've got to double, you know, double down on what you're doing. So like Bobby here, we've got the cell phone in one hand, the laptop Mm -hmm. in the other hand. He's in his car, right? I that's how I lived, and it was constant juggling. It's a luxurious lifestyle, Amanda. How many aliens would you say you work with on a daily basis? I think most of the aerospace uh, industry are aliens. See, most of the people I, who work I in it. <laughs> I, is, I, I love this aerospace my, this people. This is my wheelhouse. Aliens. <laughs> is it really? I love it. I'm a big, I'm a big fan of all, all, all things alien. So my husband's uh, in the military. And I work in aerospace. So between the two of us, We've got to know something, 
right? You, I mean, you both definitely vacation with aliens. <laughs> I don't know where you guys, I don't know what your, what your hideaway is. Like you said, you're from Rockford. So yeah. Lake Geneva probably hits home, maybe, you know, somewhere right over the border in Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. Um, how many aliens have been to your Lake Geneva uh, uh, house up there in the summertime? <laughs> You know, I don't, I don't know that there's a whole lot of aliens that reside in the Rockford area, honestly. <laughs> uh, but, but when you get to Wisconsin, I mean... That's a whole been... other bubble, man. Exactly. <laughs> Are there any aliens that have been... Like, you know, we take this sort of like human form to aliens because th- that's like, you know, like we're so self-centered. But I haven't seen any aliens that have beards. Do you know of any aliens that have beards? Yes. Several. Mm. Long beards, no less. Long. Yeah, but it's weird that they're all like, like, why don't they have any facial hair? Like, they should maybe they have great beards, like over on Mars. You don't know. Are you they assuming that most aliens are bald? Wait, I mean, wait. we like to pick them as bald, don't we? I've never <laughs> seen an alien with like flowing locks. <laughs> they have to blend in. Do they? Know? It is really weird though the way we depict them, right? I mean, it's like we all just make it up. I mean, not you. Like you'd have close friends, but. Um, we don't make it up, but that's all... those people know aliens. Those they're writing their own scripts. ET was written by it was an autobiography. <laughs> hmm. <Got laughs> you it. think that they all look like ET? No, there's uh, diversity. I think it's more like Star Trek, man, where you've okay, got all the different races. I'm down with that. Let's. That's. I couldn't agree more. Right. Okay. Um. So all right, all right. I'm done, Dan. I'm sorry. Yeah, Bobby. Just you know what. Just, just keep it on mute. That's going to be a good, a good Friday podcast if you do that. Um, but so, I mean, the the private sector for space travel is really interesting. I, I listened to Jeff Bezos talk about it. He's got mm-hmm. this. Uh, it's like an hour long talk with the Economic Club of Washington D.C. from like 2018 or 19. Have you seen that that talk of his? I haven't. So the the interesting thing that I just never thought about it this way is he said, you know, like Amazon, his company was built on a lot of infrastructure, like the internet existing. <laughs> You know, shipping logistics existed with UPS and FedEx and all these. There were a lot of things that existed that took lots and lots of money that he couldn't possibly create in his in his basement or in his garage, you know, um, mm-hmm. that he was able to use to then build Amazon into what it then became. And without that infrastructure, that wouldn't have been possible. And so he said, you know, like today, you can't start a space company in your garage, right? Yes, you can. Like, yeah, but not... You're not building rockets to go into space. No. Yes, you can. You're building a yes, tiny little can. component. Tell them. Tell them. Yeah. Okay. Tell me. No, I'm not going to go there. Uh, the the we did we definitely did some experiments on uh, radiation protection in my garage. Yeah, but that's not really the, what I'm referring to. What he was referring to is like building a a vehicle to send into space. Like there's just like yeah. too much money and and oh. facilities. Like there's so many engineering minds. All this stuff. That there's no real infrastructure in place for someone to say, oh, I'm going to make, like, for example, electric car. Uh, you can't really make an electric car in your garage. But sure one of can. the things like Tesla's done is release some open source or some of their patents. And there's a lot of existing technology that makes it possible where you could take a battery and take all these different pieces and then maybe make yourself an electric car because that stuff's existed before. Mm-hmm. So his point was that he's investing in his own company, Blue Origin, to try to like start a lot of this infrastructure going. So that maybe in 20 years, someone can start some sort of space travel company or whatever it is, a lot like the way he started Amazon on the back of, of stuff that's come before that was incredibly expensive to set up. So does that make sense? That was his main point. It, it makes sense. Uh, I, 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 I come from the background of nothing is new. You've Everything has existed in some way, shape or form, and it's just built off the next thing, right? Man did not invent fire. Lightning probably was the first thing that brought fire to us, right? So it's, I definitely feel like you you can build things, but you're never really going to invent something new. Now, does that mean I can't build it in my garage? Nope. I can definitely build things in my garage. There's plenty of uh, hobbyists <coughs> building rockets in their garage, and they might discover a new version of fuel for a rocket, right? And it, it could be complete happenstance, or it could be that, that that's what they were working on. But it's totally conceivable to uh, use someone's garage to build something new. <laughs> 
Yeah, you know, like, I, I get that. That, but the, that wasn't his central point, which was no, that, wasn't. you know, whatever it costs to put the SpaceX rocket into space, like you don't have that amount of money or that amount of resources to hire that many people to get that going, you know, in, in that sort of sense. That's all. That's all he meant. But anyway, yeah. it's an interesting unless, point. But yeah, I mean, you're 100 percent right. A lot of breakthroughs do happen in small scale for sure. Yeah, and especially during a pandemic. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, what have you invented during this pandemic? Do do tell. Um, so what, what we've been working on, I mean, I've been working on the, the college planning 101 summit, most of the pandemic, uh, a lot of what I was working on before that in the aerospace world actually got shut down because our labs got shut down. But, uh, right before that we were on the brink of major breakthroughs on radiation protection for, for deep space which I mean, it's, it's one of the biggest hurdles that NASA is trying to solve because if an astronaut is riding on a, this vehicle behind me, this Orion vehicle going to Mars, and there happens to be a, a, solar, uh, a solar storm, that those cosmic rays could take those astronauts out. And that's the last thing that NASA wants on their hands. Now, mm-hmm. astronauts know that that's part of their job. There's a risk every single time. And, you know, that's why you always hear Godspeed when it comes to a a launch, especially with humans on board. And I just kept saying it as I was watching the SpaceX flight, like, Godspeed, please, please don't blow up. Keep going. (laughs) But uh, when it, I lost my train of thought because now I'm thinking about SpaceX. (laughs) Um, So radiation protection. So obviously a, a big challenge developing that so that the astronauts have just a smidgen more protection from those cosmic rays so that NASA can feel more comfortable sending astronauts into deep space. That's what I'm working on. Once upon a time, I wanted to be an astronaut. And then I started to learn about what their bodies go through when I started working on Orion. And I said, you know, Probably not, but I might change my mind. It depends. Not for you. There's a reason that female astronauts, the average age for a female astronaut is 43 is because Mm. they're done having babies by that time. And, and that's because of all of the radiation that they're experiencing out in space. They don't have the same protection that we have here on earth. Hmm, hmm, Hmm. How do you feel about the curvature of the earth? Is the earth flat or is the earth curved? OMG. Seriously. <laughs> this is Bobby Stevens territory. This Bobby, is, are you a this, flat earther? <laughs> I am I am not, but I'm willing to listen to the discussion. Well, their only real argument and it, this was fascinating because uh, like Bobby loves pitching me conspiracy theories, so I I begrudgingly listened to a, a flat earther on YouTube and I was like, "Your only argument is that fisheye lenses are making the world seem curved?" Like, do you know how fisheye lenses work? like baffling and they, they act like the, the, the lens that or the, the windshield of a plane curves the earth. Like it's that curved, like it's refracting anyway, well, but please, we could, what's, your, what's your take there as you cringe? Oh, I wouldn't have worked in the, the aerospace industry if I thought the earth was flat. There's no escaping earth's atmosphere. If we're flat, it's not possible. <laughs> Well, well, if you get to I one end, you just stop, in- and then you back up. You go beep, beep, and then you go back to, <laughs> right. you know. Yeah, maybe we works. live in realms. Maybe there's maybe there's above and below us. There's ra- there's realms. Who knows? Bobby loves maybe. He just wants, this is what Bobby does, if you're not aware. He goes, but maybe it isn't. And then maybe he acts the like earth, that's a valid like, maybe the counterpoint. Maybe the earth is flat. You don't, nobody knows. We don't know. Well, I, I wonder, honestly, if, the, if they think like, okay, if it's flat, right? This, there's a north and a south only right Uh, one's heaven and one's hell i wonder you know that's throwing religion at them and finding out like what do you think about religion well in the rotation i mean if it was shaped like a flatbread pizza like at some point it rotates towards the sun and then like basically the entire earth is dark except for the little tiny maybe but maybe not dan maybe that's just all maybe not maybe not well that seems like obvious just physics and i don't even know physics sunrise look like It's it could be it could just be like um what's that movie uh with Jim Carrey where they watch him all the time Ace Ventura Pet Detective oh, yes. yes based on true yes. events one of my Duh. favorite movies of all time 
what's the movie? You know what I'm talking about. Uh, Truman. Truman Show. Truman Maybe show. it's like the Truman Show where they where everything is totally fake in this whole little world. Maybe we're living in that world. We're living in The Sims. We're in, we're in a simulation. We're living in a simulation. Hundred percent. We're living in a simulation. Those things are kind of I, like that kind of conspiracy or kind of that's not a conspiracy, but those kind of things I think are kind of fun to think about. The thought, little thought experiments, just like what is Dan in an alternate universe? Like, am I a, a redheaded guy with like flowing long hair and I skateboard and uh, I you might be a tree. I throw like a girl or something. I don't know. What do you mean? That's right. Amanda's right. See, she's, Mm. you are an alien, Dan. So Amanda, let's talk Mm -hmm. about how, well, we have a lot of things on your agenda, but how important is it that you pick the right school? And we can transition right back out of this line because you studied what? Aerospace engineering in college? and aerospace. Yep. Okay. So you can't study that at every school or not every school has as good a program as one would like. So, uh, obviously school choice is super important for an athlete. I think it's, I think it's a more, well, you tell me, I think it's much more part of the equation for softball players because there's much less professional softball opportunities afterwards. I think most softball players understand that after college is over, they're getting a job. I think there's a lot more baseball boys who, you know, rightly so the draft takes, you know, 1500 players on a normal year every year. So there's a lot more of like holding out for a, a baseball career, but, um, in the softball world, it what how how big of a role is is career planning? <clears throat> it's the main role. Um, so I had the opportunity. I'm gonna I'm gonna go here first. I had the opportunity to play pro, and I had the opportunity to play at international. And I let go of that dream because I got the offer to to work on NASA's Orion program. So it happens. It happens that mm-hmm. you can play beyond, but you have to be the top one of the top one. Yeah. Right? Eight, eight pro teams, right? Something like that. Is it six or is it eight? Uh, <laughs> three currently. Oh, in the, less than that. It's fluctuating. I know it's been as high. I thought it's been as high as six, right? But there were, there were five last year and two of them were international teams. Mm-hmm. So now there's only three because of everything going on. They, the two pulled out. Well, and what's a, what's a pro roster size, Amanda? I have no idea. I, I would guess probably 16. Yeah, um, it's 16 to 18, tight. it looks yeah. like. That that makes the most sense. Uh, so there's there's so not con- a lot of pro opportunity. Conservatively, the top 80 players you know, yes. in the country? Yeah, yes. I mean, and, and half those players are already there. So it's not like they're taking 80 new players every year. So, uh, yeah. No, no. There's I'd, I'd say the, the turnover or on... Um, yeah, the turnover in women's softball is actually pretty high because when you do get offered a career, you're you've got to make that decision, or you yeah. decide to get married and have children. I, that always plays a factor, and that's you know when you're at that age, that's what you're considering. Um, I didn't have kids until much later in life, so I could have technically played, but the salary for a pro player is non-existent. Well, monthly it's pretty good compared to the baseball guys. Really, five mm-hmm. k? Yeah, right. baseball guys would would. I mean, right now baseball guys are getting paid sixteen hundred a month, but they have six months a season, so they'll make eight to ten grand if they're a low level player. But you guys make five grand a month for what two and a half months because it's a shorter yes. season. Yeah. yeah, so it's still it's kind of a wash. It's a push, a very right. small amount of money, but at least per game it's a lot higher than than the baseball guys. <laughs> So uh, one of the things that the NP Wait, are you disputing doing... my math? No, I'm not disputing your math. Five thousand dollars divided by thirty days is one hundred seventy dollars a day. No, no, you got that's you a, got... that's like four weeks of salary for a baseball guy. Anyway, do it, Amanda. Our, our life is so hard. I know. I know. Get him, Amanda. Uh, it's a sliding scale, right? <laughs> there, the the pay range in true, true. in NPF, it, the average is five k. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm I'm just gonna go there. Um. Bobby, just so you know, uh, the NPF was trying to relocate to the Rosemont area. All the teams were going to co-locate in the Rosemont area to to play their season. Now, obviously, so that's happening. It it did, but they're not playing. Obviously, we're well, in the, no, no. The they're doing crisis. it. They're doing it. Um, August, September. I actually just really had a conversation about this two days ago. So they're doing. It's actually a, sounds like a good situation for the players 
Um, there's going to be a big pro there's one guy. I, I think he's from Florida is funding the whole, the whole league. They're mm-hmm. going to have four teams and it's going to be point based. So <laughs> the top four players in the league will from the previous week will draft their teams based on, you know, based on the girls in the league. And then they'll play that weekend or that week. And then like the, you get point system based on performance. It sounds like, and that'll also affect bonuses for pay. Am I still here? Yep. I'll also like bonuses for the, for how much the girls get paid and they're get and they get paid based on like weekly bonuses. If you're, you know, MVP. And so it sounds like a much better situation than what they're currently in, where there's three teams, one in Chicago, one in Florida and one in Ohio, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, but that is the plan is to still have that. Uh, I don't know if you heard something differently. I just heard a couple of days ago that the plan is still to have that based out of Rosemont, which is where my youth program is based out of um, primarily. So I, the mayor there of Rosemont is very big in the, into the professional softball league. And, and he does a lot, a lot to, um, you know, pump the league up. They do draw pretty well in Chicago comparatively. Mm -hmm. Uh, It sounds like, so it would be a good center for it. I don't know how it's going to work. I don't know what the logistics are as far as fans and games and everything right now with everything going on, but the plan is to still go forward with it. So it could be an interesting alternative to what MPF is. Mm -hmm. I love this point system that they're coming up with. It's, it's a, a different spin on sports truly. And there's other arenas that are trying this too. So football we know has, has been trying this on, and then a couple other sports are starting to adopt this whole point system thing, which I, I think is a cool revolution for, for the sport. We'll see how that pans out, though. NPF's always struggled in terms of uh, the draw, right? I mean, I remember watching games where they were playing on baseball fields, and I was like, that changes the game slightly. <laughs> yeah. Grass it's slows be the awkward. softball down. Yeah, it's, That's it's a lot of awkward. surface area. <laughs> Well, in softball, it's weird, like the flight of batted balls, like they're, they don't bounce nearly as high. Am I right on that? Like they, they seem to have very like rolly trajectories already. Then with grass, you think they'd just basically never be bouncing at all. Yeah. They die completely because yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's all about surface area and friction. That's mm-hmm. physics fun that I like to, to dive into. Yeah. All, and all minimizing radiation. Lessons, no. You don't want to hit a high radiation ground ball. That's how <laughs> people, it's not good. Cosmic cool. rays just flying at you. It's dangerous stuff. <laughs> be, that'd be, that'd a, be the sport. Do, do they have a cosmic Uh-oh. brownie dispenser in NASA cafeteria? No. I've, I've never seen a cosmic brownie dispenser, though I'd probably avoid it like the plague. <laughs> or like a dehydrated cheese ball vending machine where you like put your quarter in and it turns out some of those you know space cheese. Have you seen that? It's pretty I haven't good. seen that. But we definitely had dip and dots, and that's a that was a lovely you know NASA invention there. Uh, mm, mm. Tang, of course, we know is a, a cool invention. And then Tempur-Pedic. There's so many things that have come out of NASA, but those are like the most common ones to. to I mention. thought Dip and Dots wasn't a NASA invention. I thought it was just like some farmer, but maybe I, I'm misremembering that. Uh, well, I, that, you could be right about that. I don't know. I'm gonna, I I'm always gonna heard Google that it, it was a it was a NASA thing. But we also well, isn't this like, isn't the science behind it that if you if something gets so cold it gets into those little dip and dots balls isn't that how they do it in space yes in a vacuum <laughs> perfect so I'm oh, basically can, Ma- Amanda confirmed I'm a scientist you are nailed it let's get you a PhD and call <laughs> you doctor Doctor Bobby Doctor Bob yeah. <laughs> okay so you uh, decide to pass up your pro opportunities yes. to work for NASA. I did. Um, going back to the end of my my college career, <laughs> uh, I ended up at D2, and I had a gap year before that at a community college, and before that, I was D1. And my D1 fit was not ideal. Uh, so in high school, uh, I blew my knee out my senior year and had to forego any opportunities that I had. And um, I was basically scrambling to find a school to play. And that was my priority. I wanted to play ball in college and get a mechanical engineering degree. And when you're, when you're going for a mechanical engineering degree or an aerospace engineering or any engineering degree, you're limited 
on what schools you can actually play softball at because it's, it's a very concentrated, very mm -hmm. uh, intense degree. And uh, nobody warned me of that. It wasn't, it wasn't something that was obvious to me because it, I, I just wasn't warned. Like you're going to spend day and night doing your education in engineering and, oh yeah, we're going to throw softball on top of that. And when I went D1, I didn't realize that that was going to be 52 hours a week of softball. And then you have to do at a minimum to be a college athlete, 12 credit hours, which means that you have 12 credit, 12 hours of class time. But then on top of that, you've got 12 hours worth of studying. So <clears throat> somehow I got to sleep a little bit. Can which, you break down that 52 hours? How does that break out? Oh, that number uh, seems high to me. It, but every college experience is different. So I was a pitcher and I was an infielder and I was a hitter and I had to go to all of those private practices. So one-to-ones with the coaches and then we would have team practice and then we would have uh, team workouts. So I'd have to do, you know, 6 a.m.s with the rest of the pitchers and that meant running for forever. Um, <laughs> So I, I lived in my, my sweats and my practice uniform all day long, every day. And I basically rotated between a practice and class, a practice and class, a practice and class. And at the end of the day, we had study time and we had to do study time in the, uh, in the approved athletic area. Mm -hmm. There's hardly any engineers in the athletic area. So yeah. I considered that softball time because I couldn't actually do the work that I needed to do for my classes because I either needed to be in a lab or I needed to be with other students in my degree. And so yeah, that, that, was, that seems like a broken system. Did you tell anyone about this? Oh yeah. Yeah. Had several conversations with the coaches. Like I, I'm, I'm struggling to get my work done because you're making me do mandatory hours every week in a, a room that I can't actually accomplish anything. And I was constantly getting in trouble in that room because I was socializing because I could not do anything else <laughs> during that mm -hmm. time. It wasn't, it wasn't possible for me to do my chemistry in that room. I mean, I could write up my lab in my lab book, but I did that in class. Yeah. So there was nothing for me to do in there except socialize. And uh, yeah, I, talking to the coaches about it, they were like, well, you know, we have to have you in there at your freshman year. And if your grades aren't okay, we have to keep you in there. And I was just like, well, you're, you're the ones that are causing me to have bad grades at this point, because after I get out of this room, now I can go and do the rest of my work at nine o'clock at night. Most of my classmates aren't doing the work. They already did it when I was mandatorily in that stupid room. Yeah. <clears throat> So 52 hours a week included that sitting in the, the, uh, study room with other athletes. Okay. Fair enough. That's a good breakdown. Yeah. That's, uh, that's something that you don't think much about, but that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I had well, a teammate then, who was doing mechanical engineering and we never saw him outside yeah, of practice. Never, ever. I was like, yeah. are you, are you, you're a teammate, right? M Matt is it Matt. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Uh, Those, yeah, the study tables are the worst for college, especially if you're taking a light class load or like you said, something's very niche where it's you need to be in their labs or that school to take advantage of all the stuff you need. And then you get to go to the athletic. We, we had ours was called what the SAS department, student athlete yes. services. Um, great. I get to go. To, I have to walk a mile and a half across campus to get to the SAS department to sit in a room that doesn't have internet this is good this mm -hmm. is fun mm -hmm. for yes. 12 That's, hours and this is i mean just going back to the whole turmoil that our country is and the pushback against colleges and how overpriced they are and how <laughs> their degrees aren't worth what they used to be worth for the price that we pay and just like stupid stuff like this like why should why should they not be like oh yeah you're an engineering major okay we'll exempt you from this because it just makes good sense and we want you to get a good education like but apparently that's just like too hard for some of these college systems. That's, that's mind blowing. It's interesting. You bring that up because, uh, what I've told a lot of people is that what I used to help build the Orion program was things I learned in 10th grade. 
I barely used what I learned in my college career. There were definitely some obvious things from aerospace that I used, but when it came to the math, 10th grade, I wasn't using calculus. I wasn't using differential equations. Every once in a while that would happen, but most of the time it was trig and geometry. Mm. That was the, the nature of the beast. Um, my drafting skills came from high school. So all of the drawings that I was working on, on Orion, that, that was all skills I developed in junior high and high school. So yeah, it, it, college became a piece of paper that said, yes, I accomplished this. And that's yeah. the unfortunate reality. So, how, so what do you think is going to happen? What's, what do you think is going to happen with colleges going forward? Are people going to keep, keep paying or are there going to be a lot of gap year students this year with coronavirus? Because we need to talk a little bit about coronavirus and how the climate of recruiting is changing, just like the outlook for college athletes is changing for all this stuff. I mean, what do you see happening? Oh, man. <clears throat> the, where to begin? Uh, for the college athletes themselves, I mean, it depends on what they what their goals are and uh, what they want to accomplish. So there's that whole you can stick around for a fifth year. But if you've already accomplished your degree, are you going to stick around? Highly unlikely, right? Go get your, go get into the career space, but then looking at the career space, are there opportunities for you in this environment to actually get a job? <laughs> it's, there's, you know, there's a lot to, to really take in and consider when it comes to uh, the recruiting craziness that's going on. I mean, D one's in a dead period until July 31st. So anybody who wants to go D one, there's, you know, they can send coaches videos, but that's about it. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's no communication D two, D three, uh, they, their budgets are getting squashed. So they're not able to travel to, to do any recruiting as far as the college coaches are concerned. So when it comes to the games, showcases are going to be completely different if they even go off uh depending on what level you're at that totally determines like how far out in advance those co college coaches are looking for players so d1 is looking at players for 2022 2023 right d2 coaches are looking for players for 2021 2022 2023 d3 they're usually right at the 2021 spot looking for new players, NAIA, same thing. And, and JUCO they're year to year. Right. So, I mean, it, it ultimately it, it's, it's going to be interesting. I know a lot of coaches are really gearing up for the fact that they're probably going to have a lot of gap year kids, a lot of kids that are going to say, you know what, I'm just going to take this year off and, uh, I might do the e-learning. I might not. And, and, that's the, the big question mark still. A lot of universities have not decided whether they're going to have students on campus in the fall. There are several who came out really early and said, no way, no how. Uh, one of my associates in, in the aerospace company that I'm a part of, um, he said MIT and Cal Poly Tech are, are both, they were one of the first schools to say, we're not having students come back to campus until 2021 but both of those schools don't have major sports programs, right? They aren't relying on their football program and their basketball program to carry the load for the rest of the sports programs. If you're in a school like that, well, you know, that's, that's a, a whole nother ball of wax. We can take UConn as an example, right? They're $50 million in debt. And now they're thinking, okay, what sports do we have to cut? They have 24 and they're, they're going to go down to 16. And I'm going to guess softball is probably one of those sports they're going to cut. Fencing, so, curling, yeah. badminton, advanced Bowling. badminton, advanced badminton, um, lawn dart, ping pong. Uh, yeah. Advanced <laughs> badminton is quite popular. Dude, badminton is the most underrated sport. Yes. It's so fun. Mm -hmm. I loved playing badminton in high school. Like I, I need to get, I need to find friends who want to play badminton with me in the city. I saw some people playing in a park like a month ago. I was like, I need to be friends with you. Ah. That's why you need uh, Facebook back. Cause there's probably a badminton Facebook group. You're not a part of. Don't talk yes. to me about Facebook. Facebook is trash. I hate Facebook. I no. You are oh, the under a rock. I where have it for my like business. Where else are like-minded badminton players going to congregate? 
Um, I'm just going to go play by myself. Badminton is actually a sport. Speaking of our earlier teleportation conversation, badminton is actually a sport. You could hit it over the net, run over the other side, and hit it back to yourself. True. You look like, a, look like a fool, but this could be done. It's impressive if I just do that to watch in that. public. So when I, when I had to run the track for, uh, for my 6 a.m. Uh, practices at Illinois Chicago, there were badminton teams set up playing constantly. I was so impressed. I mean, they're all out, man. They're diving on the floor like volleyball players. I, they are all out. And it's so fun. With Batman is awesome. Yes, man. That combines all the sports I love. <laughs> but the thing about these budgets with these schools is, I mean, what does a softball program cost to school like UConn? Half a million dollars a year or something like that? Not even. It's not even uh, right around a hundred K is what a softball program. But there's costs. so much bloat as far as like administrators that schools don't seem to need overpaying like tenured professors. There's like so many other things like you could find $300,000 like anywhere where it's like they're cutting sports. I don't care that they're cutting sports. I think business decisions need to be made. Like yes. I'm not on this like emotional side of like never cut a sport. It's sport. clear that some sports like why does every school need to have every sport? Why do we I mean, need to play sports in college? No other country in the world has sports in college. They're separate, ooh. right? But we're treating yeah. it like they're pro sports. Bobby, what do you got? You seem disturbed. I like where well, I like for her. I like the outside the box thought, but it's really not outside the box because she's she's right. We are the only country like we preach go to co- you know, go to college, be, you know, get good grades, go to college, get a degree. You know, if you're lucky enough to play sports in college, great. Like I have the the privileged experience of living in the Czech Republic for a summer to play baseball. And there are two major sports in the Czech Republic are hockey, uh, hockey and soccer. Mm-hmm. So when you're a young when you're a young athlete, you're you choose and you play on the the professional soccer teams, youth club team, the eight year the eight U club team. And if you're too good as an eight U player, you move up to the 10 U club team and they go all the way through to the, it's, they don't even have high school sports. It's all club and it's all, it's all privatized and basically supported from the top down. Now, granted it's limiting opportunities because it's really, it's really filtering out kids that cannot cut it at the young ages really early. And we've all seen late bloomers and people that have, you know, come into their own later later in their athletic careers but it's she's right it's totally different in the u.s than it is everywhere else in the world and and as much as we preach multi-sport athletes in the u.s it's it's so much of one sport from the time you're very little in in these other countries i mean in the czech the only kids that played baseball in the professional league were kids that could not play hockey or soccer they just weren't athletically good enough and that's and they and they say it like that they they will all tell you that which is why baseball in these other countries is not a prime time sport or you see certain countries have certain sports like uh, Croatia's big in basketball so those the best athletes kind of filter into basketball and if you go to Italy the best athletes filter into soccer and you know so on and so forth where it's the US you have options and we have a lot of good athletes and they all filter all over the place and a lot of kids get the opportunity to bloom late and what have you. But I do like that idea. Like, do we just blow up the whole college athletics landscape? It makes too much money to make it seem like it would make sense, but well, it'll never happen. saying that it makes too much money, it's really just basketball and football. Those are the only two that make yes. any money and they fund a lot of these other sports, which is fine. Like if, fo- if your football program makes all this money and it can pay for 10 other sports, Great. That's fine. You know, like we as people, you buy a TV that doesn't make you any money. You buy a coffee maker that doesn't make you any money. You can add things as a university that just like enrich the offerings. And that's okay. As long as the overall balance sheet adds up. Right. But um, I mean, the fact that like we have a thousand colleges in America and all of them have baseball and softball teams. Like what if we lost 20% of them? Just that all the teams that exist just get stronger. Right. I mean, well, it's I, weird I that it's it's so controversial decrease. that we lose any. The I think the, uh, the division the division one model is the one that's the most difficult because those those programs bleed money in those sports. Whereas uh, my former college coach, head coach at Northern Illinois University, went back to his alma mater, which is D three school in Illinois North Central, and that program is actually 
positive for the school because they have a JV team and they have 50 kids on the roster paying a tuition and basically self-funding in that aspect where I would imagine 80 to 90% of those kids would not be attending the school if it was not for the baseball program. So a school like that, I just say, I don't know if the, obviously Amanda's like, are you crazy? No, because I just Northern Illinois has a football team. No, no, it's North Central, North Central oh, College. North Central, okay. So the, no, the division, I'm talking about the division three model where there are no athletic scholarships. So the mm-hmm. kids going there are either getting academic or they're paying the tuition. That program is essentially self-funding. Yeah, but I also don't understand that model. Why do you have 50 kids on a baseball team? And they're like well, broke they up into a JV- couple teams and they don't travel and there's a JV team. And like, how do you spread three coaches over 50 players? That just doesn't, also, it also just doesn't, I don't, I don't claim to understand it. So um, there's plenty of things I don't know about it. So I'm not necessarily demonizing, but I just don't, I don't understand how it works. Well, how does it, how does they it definitely work? have a JV team, right? They have a JV team. I, I think going there, there's, there's definitely kids in the roster going there knowing that they're going to be, it's going to be an uphill battle to make the varsity roster or the travel roster for that college. Um, I'm just talking about the, the finances of that program make more sense to me than a division one program like UIC that uh, Amanda went to or NIU like I went to because I mean, that I, school I is get that. Money. But That's, that was my point is they're pushing money out at these division one schools. But, but well, you know, the division three schools, it's like they're a little more creative. They don't travel as much. The opportunity to play baseball is still there. It feels like a more sustainable model if you were to reevaluate all, you know, baseball, softball, college sports in general. But those kids paying their tuition, yeah, you have 50 kids paying tuition to the school, but that's not to say that money's going to the team, right? Like, you don't pay your tuition to your baseball team. So how does no, that money get divided up? It's not like, you know what I mean? It does. I agree with you. It doesn't get divided up. It's not like, okay, if you bring in 50 kids, this is your, your check from the school. Your but I understand that, yeah, if that brings in people to the university who wouldn't otherwise be there, just like yeah, a great so engineering could, program might bring a lot more students to a given school and then they can do stuff with it. Like I, 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 I get that, but no doubt. Um, I mean, if you're, just, if you're just an administrator, you know, you're, you're the president of the school looking at the finances and you're looking at Northern Illinois university and seeing that the baseball program is costing you $600,000 a year and they're bringing in essentially nothing or whatever that outstanding tuition is for the 35 players in the roster. And then you look at, the division three school that's got 50 kids on the roster. So they're bringing in collectively maybe, you know, $2 million over the course of those, over the course of four years for all those students. Like, do we cut the baseball program, potentially lose a lot of those kids that are paying tuition? I think it's, it makes yeah. it, it's just a way to look at if you're like a balance sheet, you know, if you're in, it's the, like another major, uh, like at my alma mater. We are a big computer engineering school. So, you know, if you have 30 professors in computer science, they might bring in a thousand kids to that program. Whereas I was a philosophy major and we might have 10 professors who bring in 20 kids, you know, like the ratio of students that come in per professor, if that's how you would do that calculus, I don't know. I mean, yeah, you wouldn't cut the computer science program. You'd cut the philosophy program, you know. Yeah, just from a, a black and white, you know, a balance sheet, it makes sense where your popular programs and the ones that are ranked highest that are bringing in a lot of students, those are worth keeping. And if a program is bleeding money as a major, I would imagine that major would be on the chopping block or at least reevaluated on how they fund it. Or is- they could just eliminate one bathroom per building that they don't have to maintain and put toilet paper in and soap and clean one bathroom per building, kids have to walk farther so they get more exercise, so they're healthier. And you have to employ less less custodial staff and do less uh, maintenance. Could save $87,000 a semester by my, by my, my calculations. You Amanda? Know, do, we need, do we need 11 bathrooms in every building? I don't know. Just walk a little farther. You burn some calories on the way. It's a win-win, you know? All right, so back to... Less Wait, Amanda, like, Amanda had, I, I can see Amanda ready to, ready to just jump right in there. There's a couple things that popped into my head uh, about the bathrooms, honestly. So Hidden Figures, if you guys have seen that movie, if you remember mm-hmm. what they had to do. So uh, the, the women, the black women who figured out how to put us into space had to walk across Johnson Space Center to get to a bathroom for a woman that was black. Hmm. yeah 
So when we're eliminating bathrooms and we're eliminating one, let's make sure we eliminate the men's and the women's, not just one or the other. It was really interesting. T- title nine for our bathrooms. Title yes. nine for bathrooms. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. uh, we got to have that. And, well, and that's another thing to, to talk about relative to what they're trying to do, de- what colleges are trying to decide on sports, what sports can they get rid of? They still have to meet title nine. Mm-hmm. So most of the sports they're getting rid of right now are men's. It's interesting yeah. to, to see how that is playing out too in this whole. Well, it's, conundrum. It definitely goes along with schools that have football teams because if you're have if you have seventy how many Division One football scholarships are there? I believe seventy seven ish somewhere yeah. around there in the seventies. You have to immediately add women's sports and get up to seventy seven scholarships before you can add another men's sport. So then you yeah. add men's basketball and you get twelve scholarships. And now you have to add a women's sport. And not that you have to add a women's sport like it's a a negative, but to to balance that so out. Balance out yeah. Which is with football alone is is it's impo- it's almost impossible to do with you know two or three women's sports. You have to have a lot of women's sports because these rosters are just not big enough to supplement all the football scholarships you're handing out. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but it's interesting to see that there's been a couple of schools that have announced they dropped their softball programs, and I'm like, well, okay, that was twelve scholarships for uh, softball. How how are they going to make that up? Wright State was the the one recently. So Wright State was is in the conference that I used to play in. They were one of the schools that I used to play against. And now I'm like, well, that's interesting. They're dropping that, but they still have a football program. <laughs> yeah, which is uh, you prioritizing what's bringing money into the school, essentially, right? They're gonna yeah, but they've got to watch their Title Nine. So they're going to bring in more soccer players, female soccer players, more lacrosse players, potentially. I mean, those are the teams that have bigger rosters. Softball definitely does not have a large roster. Tennis definitely doesn't have a large roster. Golf, same. Right? So let's, uh, let's get back to, to COVID a little bit. So um, what do players need to know right now? What do you, what do you feel like are action items for like parents and, and players? I feel like parents need to realize in in the current environment, and this is for high schoolers, right? Uh, In the current environment, you really need to assess whether it's worth it to go to a showcase or not. Showcases cost the most in terms of what the teams have to pay to go to those showcases. And uh, it, it costs a lot for the parents to go to those showcases and stay for long periods of time. Colorado hosts one of the largest showcases in the nation. Now, are you saying showcase like a combine? Or are you saying like a tournament? A tournament that has a combine in at its okay. head, right? Okay. So it'll start off the week with with the combine, and then it'll go into the tournament play. And uh, in Colorado, we've got the the firecracker, the sparkler, and the fireworks. Those are uh, two of those are are a lot of explosive crown. devices. Yeah. <laughs> Two are triple crown, and one of them is uh, a USA tournament. And right now in Colorado, we don't know when we're going to get to play. So, and those are always over the 4th of July, and they are the biggest tournaments in the nation. And they have the biggest draw for the college coaches. College coaches aren't traveling this summer. It's not happening. So is it worth it for you to travel from Florida to Colorado to play in that tournament or do you forego this summer or do you do it because your kid really needs to play? And I, I think one of the things that I'm seeing most common right now, and it's really heartbreaking, is the level of depression that softball players are in right now because they're not playing. They're not playing the games that, that they know they should be in. They're not practicing. They're not seeing their teammates. They don't have the social aspect of the sport. And parents, it's heavy on parents, right? We, we take that to heart big time. Uh, so you have to ask yourself, is it worth it to go to those showcases this summer relative to your, the mental health of your child because you're not getting the college exposure. The 2021s, I feel, are going to hurt the most. 2020 should be set. If you're not on, if, if you didn't get your recruiting handled for, for a 2020, 
you're you're in a rough, rough, rough place. But 2021s, they're they're getting the they're getting the shaft here, <laughs> for lack of a better word. They are yeah. They're they're not going to get seen. The only way they're going to get seen is uh, to send tapes off tapes. Wow, I just dated myself to send their videos off to college coaches. Yeah, and, get your VHSs and ready, kids. And oh my gosh! Put them in yes. the mail, self addressed, stamped envelope with your hand typed letter. <laughs> That's mm-hmm. what I did. All right. San- sanitize your hands <laughs> as you package it. Oh, <laughs> uh, man. It's yeah. interesting that you said, I mean, I just had, I just did a Facebook live for my youth or my high school players as far as recruiting. And that was the same sentiment I had is that it's not going to look the same as recruiting looked the previous, mm-hmm. you know, 20 years where coaches were coming out. But at the same time, if you're not playing, you have nothing to sell uh, to sell yourself on. You have no at least stats for whatever stats are worth to college coaches, but you have no you know have no videos, no up to date video. And I think you know that, to speak about going all the way to Colorado because I do have three softball teams, uh, mm-hmm. youth softball teams that two of them do end up going to Colorado and uh, St. Louis. I think St. Louis is another big tournament in the fall yes. that yes. they do. Um, so they do both those big tournaments and coaches were just they I let they do their own schedule but they asked what I thought I said I think if people are willing to travel the sense of normalcy that maybe the tournament would bring or to take your mind off of what everything that's going on at home and if everyone can afford it I would still go I would personally still keep the tournament on and go even though the major draw the recruiting aspect the combine may be far less than what it has been in previous years I think there's a there's a lot of factors that play into this, right? So a lot of families have have been furloughed, right? Their their jobs have been put on hold. They're not getting paid. So there's a lot of teammates that might not be able to go. So now you're picking up a, a, a whole set of players that you've never played with, never seen potentially because you have no opportunity to see yeah. them, right? And you're kludging a team together. To, to go to these t- yes, kludging. Is that a NASA <laughs> term. Word. I hope we're not kludging together spaceships. It doesn't sound like a very permanent type of adhesive. Armageddon, the movie, got it right. The lowest bidder builds the thing. The what? The lowest bidder. Bidder. Oh. Builds the vehicle. Hmm. Okay. Just going to throw that one out there. They they They, build it or they kludge it? Yes, sometimes. Uh, (laughs) my job was to play Tetris with that vehicle that's over my shoulder here to make all of the things on the inside fit together and work together and then do the same thing on the outside. Although I got it after somebody already did that work. So I was just coming in to kind of sweep up the mess and, uh, yeah, sometimes it gets kludged together. But with the softball teams, that's what you're going to see because players, parents can't, can not afford to travel long distances and stay in hotels for long periods of time. And, and then you've got all the health risks. Does your kid have an autoimmune issue? Do you as an adult have an autoimmune issue that is going to prevent you from traveling? I mean, there's so many factors to take into account when it comes to this. And then you look at the game itself. So I I know uh, some of the, not even some, Pretty much every single tournament has had a different set of rules from what I'm hearing from from my kids. Sometimes the umpire is standing behind the pitcher by six feet to call the game. Sometimes the players have to be outside the dugout, spread along the, the fence all the way around to the outfield, right? And I wouldn't want to be the, the player, you know, standing in right field on the first baseline. And I've got to run all the way around to get out to right field. Like that would, I wouldn't want to be that player. It's the low man on the totem pole at the end of the fence. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, it, no stealing, no stealing in softball is a game changer. It completely changes the game because softball is built on that. And if you're trying to get recruited based on your speed, that's just been taken away from you. Wait, you're you saying they no don't allow stealing at that. some of these tournaments? Yes, they've taken away stealing because it's a high contact opportunity. I was not aware of this. That sounds just ridiculous. Insane, right? But that's that's what's happening. So like the um the t- the big fire 
let's see if I get this right, the Sparkler and Fireworks, the Triple Crown tournaments here in Colorado, the biggest ones in the nation. Hundreds of teams are coming. They are not allowed to steal. That's that, right. That changes the game. It's just, it's just baffling that that's a decision. That's, I mean, I, I personally just feel like, look, if we're going to play, we just need to understand like you're just, if someone's got it on the field, you're like, you're just going to get it. I don't like, how, how do you not get it? I, I just don't understand. I mean, it just has to be an accepted risk. It is, but like, this that's... is what the sport is. Like you can't have no one in the dugouts. You can't have the coaches not talk to players. You With can't have, time. it's just, no yeah, it's just like, it's you either like let them play or you don't. And well, I, I think there's some risks or some preventative measures you could certainly take, but changing the game is not one of them. It doesn't. The mask thing it has been such, I mean, that's it. It's almost become a political debate on whether to wear the mask or not wear the mask. Uh, do we follow the CDC or do we follow the who do you know, but in sports, especially if you're coming from flatland, right? Low altitude, zero altitude to Colorado, high altitude, and you're, you're required out. to play in a mask. Your CO2 levels go up mm -hmm. and you're playing at high altitude, which is already hard for someone that's coming from lower altitude, right? And now you've got to play in a mask. And that's one of the other, I believe, and that it might've changed. I'm not, I, I, don't quote me on this, but I believe that's one of the requirements for those tournaments is that everybody wears a mask. And I know parents are freaking out. So many that. laws, so many lawsuits. I mean, a kid's going to pass out Yeah, and it, like, it's just going to happen. But yes. yeah, I hadn't even thought about that. That's, that's crazy. That's COVID. I mean, that's that's the the scenario we're in. And like I said, I mean, just to talk about masks is one of those polarizing conversations to begin with. Like I could, I, you know, going out in public and you look at someone and they have a mask on or they don't have a mask on. There's certain assumptions that roll through your head immediately, and it's become political too. It's just it's it's crazy how that's happening. And then of course you're looking at like all the different States that are open and playing, right? That seems like a political move too, right? All the blue States are closed. All the red States are open, right? It's very, so very, where do very you, interesting. What's your uh, mask usage habits? Where do you uh, wear them? Where do you not? I, so I don't wear them when I'm working out. I don't wear them when I'm uh, out for a walk with my family. I don't wear them when I'm outdoors camping. Do you wear them? Uh, so you work out at home, I assume though? Uh, the gym's just open this week and I'm a mm. power lifter. So I'm back at the gym. <laughs> okay. Oh, I am back at the gym without a mask. And the grand majority of people at my gym do not have masks on either because again, high altitude and power lifting or even doing any sort of cardio. It, mm -hmm. It's, it's nuts to me to think that you'd wear a mask. I mean, people wear masks on purpose to, to build up their oxygenation. Right. So I don't need to practice that. That's not part of my speaking sport. of which, have you been to the incline in Colorado Springs? Oh God. Yeah. Manitou incline. So mm -hmm. that was, that was one of, uh, so my D two school that I went to university of Colorado, Colorado Springs, uh, our preseason, uh, team building thing was to do the incline together. Just and to walk it or you try to like run it. I mean, you can't, I mean, whatever you can oh, run it, but, yes, but that's you can. such a nightmare in there. I know, you, I know you can. So, uh, there's usually at least three people running it while you're dying, going up it, uh, my best time. So this tells you how many times I've done it. My best time was 42 minutes and I ran across someone, uh, running it and he was doing up and down in 15 minutes. See, this was why I brought this up. We might've seen the same person on the one time I did this. We're me and my business partner, my former business partner, Lucas. So this was how we, we did our incline. We were, we had tickets to go up Pike's peak in a little rail car. Yeah. The we cog. get there, we get there. Yeah. And they said, Hey, the weather's bad. You can't go all the way up. Do you, do you want a refund? And we had seen some attractive women going up this weird cut up into the mountain. And Lucas was like, Bar we trail. should do that. We oh. should do that. Maybe we can catch up with them. So we did. We didn't know what we were doing. We didn't know what it was. And did you catch up to them? No, we didn't. So there's no, there's no silver lining to the story. There's no silver lining. Um, and, uh, we didn't know what it was. And so, uh, we had been out drinking the previous night cause oh, we were God. like on vacation for like a 
co- like a conference. It was a strength training conference. And we just finished our busy season of the year. This is like early March. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was like, had, I think, a Wendy's Baconator for breakfast. <laughs> and neither of us had any water with us because we just didn't plan on doing athletic things. You were so going to we, ride in a car all the way to the top. Exactly. And he was going to drink vodka while doing that. Yeah. <laughs> and so we got up there and it was just, I mean, it was miserable just walking it. And so this guy passed us on the way up and been back again. And then as soon as we got to the top, which I can't remember how long it took us to do it. He was, he met us at the top as, again for his like second round. He was this really thickly built dude with running shorts on, no shirt. Mm-hmm. And he had a and he had a, a Bane mask on. He had a an altitude mm-hmm. mask on. Maybe you've yes. seen this guy. He, I'm yeah. sure he's done it thousands of times. Yes, running it with his incredibly thick legs in a in a Bane mask. And we're like, do you feel in charge? And <laughs> I'm sure he did. But I'm sure whatever that man's story is, <laughs> he's he's running from something. He's running from something. He better be practicing for you know running from a black bear or something because. Why do you do that to yourself? I don't know. Uh, as, as a power lifter, I I'm biased. I and you know I ran enough as a as a pitcher. I've I'm I'm good on running for the rest of my life. <laughs> I'll do my cardio in a hit fashion, <laughs> mm-hmm. and I'll do it you know squatting hypertrophy, squatting 15 reps, which I'm going to do today. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm good on that. Yeah, don't want to be the best at exercising and everyone's everyone's fitness lifestyle is different mm-hmm. yours sounds similar to mine where when you do things as a means to an end to an end it mm-hmm. changes how you feel about it like lifting for me it's, it was a tough breakup three years ago i'm still trying to figure out what fitness looks like for me because i don't compare myself to anyone i don't care i don't feel like i want to lift a certain amount of weight um i run consistently now which i took me a while to like feel mentally like i could do that but it's, it's a tough thing after you're an athlete for so long to like transition into fitness is just for health or yes. just to make me look good. It's, it's a wholly different beast. Yes. And, it's, uh, yeah, it's a pill. It's a pill you take rather than, at least for me, it's a pill that I take rather than something I enjoy doing. So going up and down that ungodly hill mountain mountain. So if you don't know what the incline is, it's this mile, it's like a little bit over a mile or a little mm-hmm. under a mile, a little over, very steep. What is it? Would you know what the elevation is in that mile? So you gain a mile. You gain a mile in a in a a a linear mile. Yeah. Yes. And so it's built mostly of like railroad ties. So it's Mm -hmm. sometimes one you're stepping up, sometimes it's two, sometimes it's three. So as you get up really, and it could take two three hours to to walk this thing. And if you get up there and you hurt yourself or you get dizzy or you there's no you just have to either walk back down or walk back up. Mm -hmm. There's nowhere for you to go which is really scary to think about. And they talk about how many people they have to take off that mountain every year. Mm-hmm. Cause you get halfway up there and you're like, good God, what did I sign up for? Just walking. It's really, really tough the altitude. Just, yeah, it's, it's, it's worth doing, but it's pretty intense just for a walk anyway. So, uh, I don't know how we got there, but Neither. masks. Oh, we're talking okay. about masks. Oh, okay. yes. Yes. You had to, you had to do the Bane voice. Do Man, you that feel was in charge? <laughs> Well, I have a mask that's very Bane-like. It's white, but it's just the style of its, I mean, that same shape and it's intense and weird. What a My good movie. What a good over. movie that one was, though. Oh, man. Such right? a good Batman. Those Batman couple movies are just superb. Honestly, I feel like those were like hardcore into the mental game. Like if you want to go to an extreme of learning the mental game, you, you do that. You do what he did in those movies. What Christian Bale did or what yeah. Bane did? Both. Not Bane, but Christian Bale slash Batman. Believing right? that he could make the jump? Exactly. Yeah. Those were some of my favorites in terms of that. In terms of that. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, um, Bob, are you still with us? Absolutely. What do you, what do you got? Uh, I, love the, I love the Batman movies. Big Batman guy. He's but not even a real superhero. Batman? Like I'm sorry. old school bam pow bang Batman or Blamo. No, Christian Christian Bale bat Batman. I I t- like did you guys see the Joker? Did either one of you see the Joker? I haven't. No. Yet. Oh. Yeah. I makes know. me makes you root for the Joker. Makes really? you root for the one. 
Yeah. I watched another good Heath Ledger movie recently, The Patriot, <sighs> no, Mel Gibson. Yeah. Also a great movie. Mm-hmm. But if we're no. if we're going if we're going superheroes, I'm a Wolverine. I'm a Wolverine uh, fan. Really? Maybe that's why I'm wearing the headband. <laughs> no one knows why you're wearing the headband. I wear I wear it, them when I do no, the no good do my manual labor gig. What was that? When you do what? When I do manual labor, oh, which okay. is pretty much every day. Bobby's been pouring a lot of concrete. All right. In case you uh, need anything in Colorado. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's talk about you. So your D1 experience at, at uh, Illinois, Chicago didn't end well. No, no, it did not. Um, bad fit for education, bad fit for softball program. Uh, it was a top 25 school when I went there. And uh, my mental game was weak. And it's probably one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about the mental game now. Um, but my mental game was weak and the coaches did a fantastic job of pointing that out on a daily basis. Mm. And uh, the coach that I came in under got a little violent with one of our players and was forced to retire my freshman year. And he was a football coach. So he was used to that. He always talked about softball as a game of inches when that's a football term. I loved that though, because it is. Why was uh, he coaching softball if he was a football coach? He was coaching, he'd been coaching softball for 20 something years. But so, was he a baseball player? Did he have a background or just like read a book? I don't know, man. I don't remember. He knew the game. He knew the game well. He, uh, he, he was very methodical about what he did. Um, but, in the end, he, he was forced to retire, unfortunately. And the two co-coaches, co-assistant coaches took over as head coaches. And the head, the, the new head coach and I, uh, butted heads and it was really unfortunate. The reason we butted heads, and I'm not going to dive into that because it has to do with his personal family stuff. Um, but we butted heads and I started to see the demise happen, particularly when I was sitting around the, the stretching circle at the beginning, beginning of a practice. And he asked the team, who's smarter, Amanda or Amy? Amy wasn't there. She's the other engineering student on the team. And all the girls like looked around at each other, like, what is going on here? And they all chimed in and said, well, Amanda's smarter because she has more street smarts than Amy. And it was true. And I really hope that Amy got more street smarts as, as her life <laughs> went on. Uh, but I, I knew right then, like something's up. Right. And uh, he ended up getting physical with me at a practice. And that ended it for me. That was it. Uh I quit on the spot and then I remained at the school. And when it came to the engineering program at that school, I was used to being a big fish in a small pond in my high school. I was very charismatic and I got along really well with the teachers and I had to have that connection with my teachers. And what ended up happening was uh, I didn't have that connection anymore because I was in a class of 500 students and you never had contact with the, the professor. You might've had contact with your, your TAs, but even then it was rare. And I didn't, it, it wasn't a good fit from an education standpoint. They were also the, the mechanical engineering degree was based around cars. And I grew up holding the flashlight for my dad in cars my whole life. I was over it. I wanted, I wanted to learn about spacecraft. I wanted to learn about planes. I wanted the aerospace aeronautical side of the house. And it, it just wasn't a good fit. And I stuck it out through my junior year. Um, even so let's see. Yeah. Fall semester. I was when I quit the softball team and I stuck out the rest of the school year in a deep, dark depression. And I was still living with all the softball players and I was watching them go to their games. And it's the first time in my life I'd ever quit anything. It was the first time in my life that I ever felt true hatred from someone. 
and I, I didn't know how to handle it. And so I, I became excruciatingly depressed. I uh, went home the next semester. Uh, so my, my first semester of my senior year, I went to a junior college. I got to do differential equations at a junior college. I thought that was pretty impressive. Um, and after that year, I transferred out to a D2 school where the coach was from Chicago. So it kind of felt like home. I was going to a place that I'd visited a multitude of times uh, that I absolutely loved. And, and this became, Colorado became home. And I haven't moved home to Illinois since. <laughs> why didn't you, uh, why was there no recourse against the, uh, the coach that? Uh, cause I didn't, I didn't press charges. Uh, <laughs> I regret I have truly, I didn't press charges. Uh, and the, the administration didn't believe me because there was only one other player at the practice. And I'm going to guess that she got paid off with a scholarship so that it was all hush hush. And this was before college coaches feared of losing their jobs from parents calling the administration and complaining. This was back in, in 2001, 2002, 2002. Actually, yeah, 2001. It was the 2001, 2002 school year. So yeah, crazy times, crazy times. It was a bad fit. And I think that honestly, that's one of the biggest driving factors for me on a personal note of why I, I wanted to do this summit one, because I'm, I'm coaching, uh, I'm coaching players privately and I need to learn what the process is like for recruiting. Well, so so, so I can clarify real quick about yeah. the summit. Cause we haven't really talked about it. No, I know. Yeah. So college planning one one summit, it's all about the recruiting process, but it's, it's going at it from a holistic perspective. Um, the first day of the summit is all about the physical game. What do you have to have in place fundamentally to play at the college level? Day two is all about the mental game, which is kind of obvious to me, but what, what does your mental game need to look like going into college, which I'm super passionate about. Mm -hmm. And then the day three is all about the recruiting process. How do you afford college? Uh, what do you have to do to, to get there? Like test taking, uh, when do you start the recruiting process? All the multitudes of things that you need to understand to get recruited, like the skills video. Um, yeah, it's the, it, this summit's really uh, me hoping that I can help players not go to the wrong college. <laughs> I want players to find the right fit from an educational standpoint and a softball standpoint. Yeah. And a lot of the mental stuff is stuff that, and this is what's I think hard about being an old withered athlete, like both of us is, and Bobby as well, where you want to warn kids and you want to give them tools that they don't really need. Like you want to give them, you know, if, if you imagine like your journey through softball as a, a mountain climb, you want to say, Hey, you won't need this for a while. And it's really heavy, but you should take it. Mm -hmm. And you're like, I don't want that. It's going to slow me. That's like what the mental game is. And a lot of the high level pitching strategy stuff is there's things that they don't they have an experience. They don't know they exist. And so they don't know that they need them until they do. And then you get in a situation like you were in, or like I was in as a player um, where a coach embarrasses you, or you just can't hack it at that level. And you don't know how to pull yourself up to it. And suddenly you're like, I don't know what to do. I never had a confidence problem. And now I go out there and I expect to lose. And I don't, I, I don't feel like I can play this game anymore. And so you try to give kids the tools to not, you know, hit that impasse, but it's really hard because if they never had confidence issues in the game, how do you tell them that they need to be more confident, you know, or they need to, it's a really tough, it's, it's tough to do that. And a lot of times, I mean, what's your experience? Do you feel like most players don't really buy in until they've had something happen where they're like, oh yeah, I need, I need this. I need a change or what? I feel like the, the players, especially the players that I, I am coaching the private uh, one-to-one -one sessions that I'm doing, I'm teaching them the mental game while teaching them the physical game. And most of the time they're like, you know, I had no clue, right? I'm teaching them uh, philosophy of pitching or philosophy of catching or philosophy of hitting. Uh, but I'm doing it from the standpoint of she, she's still getting the physical game in at the same time. Uh, 
if, if it came down to, you just need to learn the mental side of things. Here's a course for you. I, I don't know that a lot of kids are going to be like, yep, I need that parents. However, Mm -hmm. recognize it. Parents will immediately recognize because they know their kids the best, right? They'll immediately Mm -hmm. recognize you. You need to, uh, learn more patience or you need to, you know, build more confidence or you need to have a coach that helps you build your confidence. And that I think is the, the true, the true path is that coaches need to be instilling more confidence in their players, praising them more, especially girls, boys. And this is, this is so philosophical. You'll love this. I feel like boys, uh, they play to win. They play for the rush of the win and girls play because they, they they play well when they feel good and boys feel good when they play well. Right. I would, I would tend to agree. I obviously have a lot less experience. I'm never been a female athlete, not a girl, but (laughs) you can see the difference in the, in the, the dugout dynamic. It's so different. Yeah. And coming from a baseball world, you're like, why are they cheering constantly? Like, what are they doing? Why are they so happy? What's happening right now? Where do they learn all these cheers? But those are an integral part. You can just tell those are an integral part to their experience. And without them, if it was a baseball dugout, they wouldn't be happy. I'm sure. Did either of you do Boy Scouts? No, I did not. Okay, so in in Boy Scouts, what I'm I'm learning from my neighbors, because I didn't do Boy Scouts, I did Girl Scouts. Uh, but that was a very short lived thing before sports happened. Um, they do um, they do what are they called? Skits. They do campfire skits, and there's this unity that gets built in those skits and the cheers for the girls. It's that unity. Right. Mm-hmm. It's that that cohesiveness that that makes the team. And man, I I spout off some of them every once in a while. And like uh, I had somebody working on my sprinkler the other day and I spouted one off and they were like, are you a cheerleader? And I was like, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> but it's one of those cheers that you do as a, a either a coach or a player. But it's how you stay in the game as a, a, a girl. You know, it's your focus. You know you're focused if you can do the cheer. And uh, and it it pulls you together as a team. It's one of those unity things. Mm-hmm. I think coaches do need to realize, though, that, that for girls, praise is the way. And not tearing down. Tearing down has its place but it shouldn't be the the main driver in the way you coach. It shouldn't be the main thing that you're constantly doing. You have got to build them up because otherwise they're constantly going to psychoanalyze themselves. Every single move, every single pitch, every single at bat, they're just going to, you know, Oh, I did this wrong. Oh, I did this wrong. And I see that so much. And it breaks my heart that kids are so critical on themselves. Where did they learn that? It's not instinctual to, to beat yourself up. It's not. You know, what's interesting. And when I coach, when I have like either I have a handful of one-on-one softball players, or I used to work with uh, some of the girls softball teams that we have. um, It's, it's funny how much, like how much more I get their attention just off the bat without having to, necessarily like hey quiet down all right listen up type deal like the they're they're way more focused yeah they're way more focused they're way more intent on on like the task and and yeah and obviously like different age groups of all you know once we get into teenagers with with girls and boys like they lose a little bit of focus just naturally Mm -hmm. on both ends but like the like a 12 u girls team or a 10 u girls team it's like their attention is immediate when you start talking to them. And I don't know if that's the, you know, the, the dynamic maybe because I'm not a parent coach when I'm with a lot of these, like with a lot of these younger teams, but I'm also not a parent coach with the, with the boys that I have. And it seems like they're just wild when it's trying to get their attention or trying to get them focused. And the girls are very, if you ask them to take a knee or, or sit in the center of the field, like they just right away, Boom. Female right. athletes are superb citizens. I mean, they really they're are. They're so just like a joy better. to train. They're so much, they're so much so better than the guys. It's easier to like get to like run a practice and just everything runs so smoothly where it's if 
God, God forbid one, one thing happens where like, I don't know, a squirrel runs onto the field. I lose the boys for about 15 minutes. So that's, that's my, that's my limited baseball softball, but it's the boys are just so much harder to keep corralled. And it's what, for whatever reason, it's just not, it's the practice is like a half a struggle. So the, I know why coaches discipline boys teams, how they do. And I get, I understand how you, how sometimes you have to like get a, get over the top, yell at them. And okay, you guys have to focus now because they <laughs> just do not. Yep. Yeah, well, well, it's also, it's also tricky too, because in mm-hmm. today, I think more kids in general are growing up soft where they can't handle constructive criticism. They can't handle being corrected even. And that becomes like the last couple of years for me coaching my boys baseball teams was harder than ever previously. And not this like one year to the next, but they just, it's hard to know what's good for them. Cause as a coach, like I'm not the same with every player. I'm different with every player. You hold like a similar standard for everyone, but you try to read their personalities and give them what they need. Um, and not just be uniform because that really doesn't work very well. But knowing that some of these kids need to be tough to get through the really tough times in the future, you have to be tough on them, especially with the boys, but yet it's more boys than ever aren't, they, they don't do, they don't handle that well. And you can't just praise them and praise them and praise them and praise them. Cause then when they get to college baseball, it's not like that. And then they just, they crack when they hit 200 for the first time and coaches on them and then there's no one there to help them. Like mommy and daddy aren't going to get you playing time. No one's going to vouch for you except for yourself and your teammates are competing for your playing time. It's a, it, it's a hard, I, I, I found it to be really difficult. My last couple of years uh, coaching boys baseball teams, just trying to figure out what was right for them. Cause it's like a, it's just like kind of like throwing things at the wall. Sometimes the way you talk to them to get the result that you think is right for them and is good for them long-term, not just today, but long-term, like they can go home sad tonight if it makes them better in the long term. Mm-hmm. But a lot of parents don't see it that way. And they'll get in your ear about it. Like, oh, why is my kid coming home sad? Well, it's because he didn't hold he didn't hold the standard today. And I let him know about it. And I wasn't gentle about it. But it's going to make him better in the future when a college coach is even more ruthless than I was. And ruthless was not the right word anyway. But yeah. I love that both of you coach and you don't have kids in the softball world. Most most of the, the coaches in the travel ball and the high school level have kids on the team. Yeah. Well, it's hard not to, I mean, or as a, as a parent in, in this climate, like it's not local baseball where you just run around an old butter maker can, you know, coach the, did you get that, uh, that reference? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I figured you would, you're up on your pop culture, but there's no butter makers anymore because it's hard to, it's hard to be that. And, Parents want to have control and they want to have their say and they don't deserve a say in the playing time, stuff like that. They deserve uh, it, it to give context. They give deserve to get con give context. Mm-hmm. And coaches yeah. should be receptive to other opinions. But a lot of times it's just like me giving you advice on space travel. Oh, why well, you shouldn't make that spacesuit look like that. It's like, Dan, you don't know and you don't know literally anything, Dan. Like literally you don't know one thing about space travel might have some but yet i have an opinion but yet i have an opinion so you know i quit coaching teams and i've i've kind of sworn it off um because what i noticed is when i coached down in colorado springs high school level down in colorado springs uh those kids were i don't want to say underprivileged but they 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 were happy to be on the team. They were excited to be on the team and they were, they were there to learn, but a lot of them struggled with their grades. So we were constantly doing tutoring and stuff. And of course me as a mechanical engineering student, I was helping with math. Um, and then I came up North where kids were a little more privileged and, uh, entitlement became the thing that I was dealing with, with those kids. And it was crazy to experience that. And then there was travel ball. Travel ball became drama. And you're, uh, you're definitely with your team a lot longer in a travel season than you are in a high school season. But I was coaching a 12. Yeah, we were 12 and under. (laughs) And the drama was so high. 
and the parent influence was so high that it wasn't worth it to me as someone who didn't have, I wasn't getting paid. I didn't have a kid on the team. I had no stake in it other than to give back to the softball community. And what Mm -hmm. I decided was I'm not going to coach anymore. Uh, Culture seems to be something I need to learn, (laughs) Uh, but I know that I can reach the kids on an individual level. And, and it it goes back to this whole summit too, uh, the college planning one-on-one summit. It it's to give back to the softball community and, you know, I'm not going to get paid a whole lot to do this, but at the same time, like I know I, as a play, someone who had an immense amount of learning as a, a softball player, I have to give back to the sport. I have to give back to the parents, especially they're the most underserved in the sport, right? They're the ones shelling out all the dough and the, the kids are getting all the glory and all of the, the notice. But I mean, the parents are the ones that aren't getting good information or they're, there's just way too much information out there. And yeah, I just, it's, it's, it's tough to look at the coaching scenario and say, yeah, that's something I want to do again for me. There's no way I'll go back to it. Yeah. I felt, I I felt, I felt a similar way. Bobby, where do you fall on it? You don't actively coach a team though. You just run your organization. Right. I don't, I don't necessarily coach any individual team. I run all the practices, which is, I guess I have my hand in a lot of the teams, but you did, to touch on the point with the parent coaches, I think, and it's, I find it with the younger guys. I just don't know anybody who has the time to dedicate to that amount of either practice yeah. games or combination of both other than the parents who are driving the kids there and usually wait around for practice. So to, it's almost, you're almost at a dead end when you like, you want to do right by the kids and in a, in a, perfect world you'd have a non-parent coach with someone who knows the right things to do and can teach the kids both life and sport and everything like that but those people that exist like that are going to demand a premium and that demand and that amount of money is just not it just doesn't exist in yeah in the youth sports world essentially or if it does exist it exists few and far between so those coaches go to where that money's at because like you said, it is with everything you deal with, with a lot of these parents and with a lot of the, you know, the. Oh no. I'll I'll be, I'll be Bobby for a second. And are all the parents that you deal with and the amount of money that you have to spend? Well, it just becomes really hard. It just does to find, especially in smaller towns, you just like can't find X ex ball players of either sport, baseball or softball, who just like have the free time. It's hard to make it like the, the, I think the guys and girls who can become this full-time non, I don't have a kid on the team coach are usually like they just retired from pro baseball or college baseball and their spouse has a good job and they can make it work because they don't really know what they want to do with their life. And they, you know, they don't have to worry about money that much because their spouse makes some, that seems to be the person that fits into that Tetris. You know, that little slot, like you mentioned earlier, Mm -hmm. but for everyone else, like in in my town that I lived in Bloomington, Illinois, which is 110,000 people, there weren't that many ex college and pro players around. And the ones that were, were like pairing off, getting married and trying to provide for their families and being away all summer, every weekend, isn't what you want to do with your spouse necessarily. Yes. It's a lot of really fun times of it's like prime weekends of your summer. You have to give away. Mm-hmm. and uh, and then find someone that's going to do it for like a paltry hourly wage that's well below minimum wage when you really add up all the hours. It's uh, it's unfortunately just like an untenable situation. But Well, and it, and it feels like there's not, it's not a hand in hand with the parents teaching the kids, you know, sport. It's, it's the kid gets dropped off at practice. And if you're the coach of that team, okay, well you teach them everything. And it, and we all know, like, there's just not enough time if you have 12 kids on a ten, 10 to 12 kids at a practice to dedicate all your time to one specific thing and working with, like, kids have certain needs in, in softball, baseball, whatever sport. You know, I remember growing up, like, I played catch with my dad all the time. Like, I was begging to play catch with, you know, not that he wasn't around, but, you know, he comes home from work and I'm ready. I'm like, hey, 
let's go. Like, what are you waiting for? You worked nine hours. Like nobody cares. I'm ready to play catch. And we, or we go to the park and we play baseball with each other. It's become so much of like an organized sport where it's okay. Your baseball practice is from five to six thirty, And now we pick up Johnny from baseball and he goes to, to tutoring for an hour. And then he's got uh, whatever he's in, plays an instrument. And it's like the parents are almost chauffeurs and take the kids and do their best to take them everywhere. When I, I always stress like the best thing you can do with your own kid it, for sports is just like participate with them, shoot baskets in the backyard. They're going to get a lot better at basketball than they would if I had them for an hour for a shooting lesson or they send them to an instructor or any for any sport. I feel like the kids that play the most and ha- enjoy it the most are the ones that go the furthest. So, yeah. may, I mean, it's just that's just from an outsider like that. I don't have a child watching a lot of kids and you can tell the kids who show up to practice that have been working with their parents or work or they go to the park and play. It's, it's very evident that who's been like, who's really interested in the sport and who's being driven to this practice, that sport. Yeah. Well, and I addressed this actually. So I, I just revived, um, my other podcast, dear baseball gods, which will be, this is going to be like a short, like 15 minute one uh, every week. And I also started a softball podcast, which I like soft released today. I didn't really tell anyone yet. I'm trying to like get the episodes kind of stacked up before I kind of like put it out there. Um, but the topic of my baseball one today, which you can find it if you look it up to your baseball gods, um, was this whole COVID thing and how players feel without the game. And I mentioned that a parent reached out to me and said, hey, my son, who's an outfielder slash pitcher, hasn't really been doing much. What should we be doing? And my question was, he should have been doing baseball stuff this whole time. He should have been getting fly balls hit to him, begging someone to go hit with him, to go throw. Like so much of this stuff isn't, it, it's extremely self evident and obvious. Like you're an outfielder. What do you think you should have been doing? You should have been taking fly balls with a friend or just begging your parents to hit you fly balls like every day. Like every day. And if that's something that's not obvious to you, you're not like really a ball player. And that's okay. You can just be like a, a part-time, like I like playing baseball. That's completely okay. But the kids, like you said, Bobby, the, there's many kids that don't need to be told what they should be doing. They're just trying to do baseball stuff at all hours. And those always those are always the best players because they're so passionate about the game. You don't have to force them to do anything. For sure. Yeah. And then you're talking about these, you know, you, your son plays on a club team and he takes and he takes private lessons and all that stuff is it costs a lot of money and it's very expensive but it's not enough time you yeah. know i i hitting I ground balls your kid is free yeah well i think that you know there's a lot of programs that i'm around and i think you know dan your your program is one of them when you guys had the travel teams we practice a lot I, we probably have three practices a week and totaling four to four and a half hours a week that's getting you know, in my, in my opinion, getting what you're paying for, but that's not nearly enough to be good at your sport. Like four and a half hours worth of, of anything a week is, yeah, you might be okay at it. Like if you practice, you know, if you go to the gym and you're at the gym that many hours a week, like you might be in okay shape, but you're not going to be in tip top shape. And you might not, you might spend that time, you know, studying to be an astronaut, but you're probably not going to be the best astronaut. So it's, it's just it's, we also don't learn the uh, like the improvised stuff. Like when you're just out there like playing ball by yourself with a buddy, you start to like make those Derek Jeter throws. You start to do stuff that's just unique that you would never do at practice. And those little improvised actions, baseball and softball, are so important. And that's why the Dominican baseball players they grow up and they're so good at a, such a young age because they're at the field all day, and they're and they're not limited by do this drill and do this drill. They're just like throwing. They're just taking ground balls they're just seeing what sticks and they're improvising and being athletic and that's such a good environment to grow up in as an athlete but it's it's not really the culture here in america yeah and those those hours stack they stack up really fast yeah that talent stack is just i would love to know how many ground balls a 12 year old dominican infielder has taken in his life i would it's got to be fascinating how big how huge that number is like a 12 year old who's like good, who's playing competitive baseball in the Dominican, like on the track to be, to maybe be somebody, the amount of ground balls he's probably taken by age 12 has got to be just a staggering number. 
You know, at, the, at the very least, he's around, you know, it, other baseball players. You, you talk, you know, basketball, I think, is a good example because it doesn't cost. It's not a sport that's very expensive. You have a, well, if you have a ball and you can find a hoop anywhere, you can play for hours. Baseball, you kind of need, you know, partners to play. But mm-hmm. if you go to the if you go to the the, the courts in Chicago or or New York or DC is a big basketball hotbed. I mean, if you're a good 13 year old, you're playing against guys that are 17, 18, 19 years old outside, and you're getting thrown around and beat up. But like that's like the big Derrick Rose story is that he always hung out with his older brother, and he was basically groomed to be a really good basketball player. Not only because he played so much, but he's also playing against older guys all the time. And he's constantly getting, you know, he's getting treated. He's, he's forced to play catch up. Like if he's not good enough, if he wants to keep playing, he better get good enough or he's just not going to get on the court. So it's like that, that eat or be eaten type mentality. Um, and you see a lot of like New York, New York street ball courts are always packed with people standing around watching basketball. Well, the young kids that end up getting on those courts, are the ones that, you know, can handle the, I guess the, the rough and rugged, you know, play of those older guys and they, and they learn to adapt and overcome and kind yeah, of, sure. through. yeah. So Amanda, let's, uh, as we start to wrap up a little bit, let's talk more about the recruiting summit. So I'm going to be a part of it. Yep. So for those of you listening, I have two talks. One will be live, which will be on softball throwing and some fielding stuff. Uh, another, I did a recorded talk that's going to be played and that's on the mental side of the game. And I'll also be giving a campfire story are you providing marshmallows or do i need to get my own you got to bring your own hot chocolate marshmallows uh graham crackers you got to bring your own i mean what I kind of marshmallow person are you as in There's, like burn it or, or exactly crisp you, it? yep yeah i'm a burn course. it kind of girl but i crisp it first let it get nice and gooey and then char the outside because i mean that caramelization so wait that's a, that's a good take bobby where are you at with marshmallows yeah, I'm uh, I'm indifferent. They're messy. It's like you bite into them; it's all over the place. I'm not a big marshmallow. Terrible take. Yeah, you're I, just go just back on. Mute. Go back on. Not a mute. messy eater. Go, go back on mute. I don't like. I'm I'm gonna mute myself again. Thank you. That's for the best. Um, so tell us. <laughs> tell, <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I love how he like digitally like went back in his hole. Bobby, I love you. You're the best. Um, Playing its part so so well sometimes. Um, so the recruiting summit. Uh, who are some of the people that'll they'll be in it? Um, what can people learn about it uh, if they want to partake? Because obviously, if you're on my email list and you're listening, um, and I'll be sending this out to my email list for sure. Uh, you know, I'll send you links and we'll put the description or in the in the show notes of uh, of this podcast so you can can link to it. But what do people need to know about it? Uh, I kind of went over the the grand scheme of things. There's a kickoff party on uh, June 9th at, let's see, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. Um, That kickoff party will really give you guys a taste of of what it's all about. Uh, But there's also some giveaways going on during that. So um, we have a couple of sponsors who sponsored the event, Easton and Blast Motion. I um, sponsored it and I have some ghost advanced bats and you get to choose your weight and size. And I have some Easton batting gloves and I have uh, some blast motion sensors. So I'm going to be giving away some of those. Uh, introducing all of the speakers. I know a bunch of them are planning on showing up to that session so that you guys can ask the burning questions that you have about the recruiting process what fundamentals need to be in place, what does the mental game really look like for a college athlete, and then, of course, the multitude of questions revolving around the recruiting process. Some of the big names uh, from the baseball side of the house, we've got uh, Steve Springer. He's going to be talking to the whack jobs, the parents, about uh, not ruining their kids. Don't push your kids. So we just talked about this, Dan. You were mm-hmm. you were just talking about like, you know, a mom reaching out to you and your kid didn't do anything over the break over this this COVID conundrum. Are you supposed to ride them as a parent? No, nah, it doesn't work. It's just and, and that was kind of my advice was that it's just time as a parent just to take an inventory. Like, look, my kid didn't do anything in these three months. This college baseball thing or this college softball thing just might not really be in their future. Or if it is, it needs to change now. It was interesting for me 
to, to experience this because I went from having 25 lessons a week and those kids were consistent and the parents were like, yes, we need a, a lesson next week. It's going to be at this time to, I had three or four kids show up to my, I did $5 group lesson group practices. I had a, one or two of my kids show up to those three. I had three kids show up to those out of the 25. I only had two or three kids show up for virtual lessons. And I mean, I gave them all the opportunities and it just, it baffled me. I was like, what is, what is going on here? And then I started talking to them and and this is where that whole depression thing came in, right? Those kids were depressed and, and they were confused and they were frustrated and they were angry and they were going through those, you know, all those phases of, of grieving. And, uh, I, I take that into consideration. This is probably the first time a lot of those kids have ever experienced something like this. It's, it wasn't easy for any of us. It's still not, we're still coming out of it. It's still a thing. Um, so yeah, Steve Springer is going to talk to the parents about that. Dan, obviously you're going to be talking about, uh, the mental game in, in the recorded session. Um, I love that session because I realized so many interesting things about you that we have in common, uh, how to help a kid get into that mental place that they need to. Mm -hmm. There's some tools that was phenomenal. Um, I just talked to Nate Trotsky yesterday. He's going to talk, uh, fielding with us. That's That's great. It's a good pickup. He's a great, I've seen some of his drills. It's awesome with the glove work stuff. Right. Holy crap. Uh, Impressive. Um, Unbelievably impressive. I was stoked to get him. Um, Let me go to my list over here. Uh, Trying to think of baseball guys who I've got. Uh, Jason Livernoy. uh, He's out of right out of uh, chaos clubhouse here. He's a baseball guy. He's going to be talking about virtual reality and how that's changing the game. He uses it at his clubhouse and it, it's Moneyball, I think. I mean, it's it's such an advantage to be able to use some of these tools, these tech tools in the game. Uh, Nick Esposito, he's a, a strength and conditioning coach. We talked about uh, strength training for athletes and recovery. Uh, Austin Wasserman, we talked about throwing like a girl <laughs> and how to redefine that phrase. Um, Rob Livingstone is, uh, the director of strength at Williams college. We talk about the before and after of a a college athlete based on strength and conditioning. Don Petro, my pitching coach from college, my all time favorite base or softball coach. He was a baseball player too. Um, he's going to talk about what skills, uh, you have to have. So do you have those skills to play at the college level? That's, that's our chat. Uh, Samantha Livingstone, who's an uh, Olympic swimmer. She's going to be talking about perfectionism and the journey back to joy. It's It's unreal. Yeah. Perfectionism in sports is the worst, especially in softball. Yes. Going to be out all the time. You're going to make good pitches and they're going to find a way through the infield or, you know, fall in for a blooper. Yeah. It's baseball a bad sport and, to be in that. Exactly. Baseball and softball. It's, it's all about the percentages mm-hmm. and to expect yourself to live to perfection 10 out of 10 every single time. That's insane. Uh, it, it's, and yeah. it blows my mind, especially the, the, the athletes that want it so unbelievably bad. I'm guilty. I was a perfectionist. I'm, I'm a recovering perfectionist. Um, Paige Tones is going to be talking about confidence with, with athletes. Uh, and then we dive into the, the recruiting side of the house. Uh, we're going to talk tests with Jen Henson, um, ACT, SAT, and, and how that's changed with the COVID environment. Some schools are not requiring it, but the NCAA still does. So there's, there's some weirdness there. Uh, Rachel Coleman's going to be talking about parents, or actually she brought in parents and students that have gone through her recruiting process or are going through her recruiting process. And I love that session because the parents finally get to see like how much involvement should a parent really have in the recruiting process? Parents, it's not much. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It really isn't. Chris Caldwell, uh, she's highly connected in the softball world, used to put on camps. She might still actually for, with a bunch of the Olympians. Uh, she's a financial advisor. Her topic is college from there to here. 
So thinking about it backwards. So usually we think, okay, I've got to start saving money now in order for my kid to go to school. What does it look like then? Uh, how much do I have to have in place? But she actually flips it on its head, which I'm totally stoked about that one. That's a live session. Chris Seedham and I did a boatload of sessions. I chunked his down into 15 to 30 minute clips and we did uh, the skills video, when to start the recruiting process, what are recruiting services and how to use a recruiting service. Dan, I'm, I'm bummed we didn't get to talk about that. Um, <laughs> and then uh, Mike Gross is talking recruiting simplified, like out of all the sessions, that's the one. If you want to know the recruiting process, listen to that one because he made it easy. He made it simple. And I love simple, even though I'm a mechanical and aerospace engineer, I like simple things. Simple man is my all time favorite song. Just saying. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Emily Nurem is a D2 coach who's also coached D1 and D3. She's going to be talking about the, the diversity in the different levels, but also the diversity of recruiting amongst different colleges. Every college recruits differently. It's crazy. Uh, yeah, we've got a couple of interactive sessions on day one. Um, Emily Goodall is talking goodbye, pain, hello, starting lineup. She's a, a physical therapist. She's actually going to run you through a self-assessment during that session. I'm excited about that because I've got a couple of weird things going on from powerlifting. And I'm like, okay, let's, let's see how a self-assessment rolls out. And then uh, one of my personal trainers, John Wee Jun, he is going to be doing why your back hurts and how to fix it. He's actually doing a mobility workout. So we're going to all get together on a Zoom call and do a workout together. I'm totally excited about that because it's probably the only workout I'll get that week, <laughs> which is so unbelievably unfortunate since I'm a power lifter preparing for worlds, potentially going to worlds. But yeah, that's it. That's the gist of it. Very cool. Sounds like I'm mean, pretty well-rounded and yeah. So um, tell us how parents can find more about it and where they can find you on the web. All right. Collegeplanning101summit.com is the website to, to go get registered for this free summit. It's free on the front side. And if you don't want to sit through 27 hours of content in 72 hours time frame, then you buy the all access pass. I want to mention really quick about the all access pass. Um, portion of your all access pass goes to the Natasha Watley Foundation. Natasha Watley is one of the best black softball players in the game ever. Uh, she's one of the best players in the game ever. And her foundation reaches uh, underserved communities with softball. She's going and, and as a black woman, I love that she's going to these communities and helping them to understand like, this is what softball could do for you. And here's how to make that happen. In this current world that we're in, that is so unbelievably powerful. So if you buy the all access pass, part of that money is going to her to help those kids. If you're looking for a way to help in this racially crazy climate that we're in, that's an opportunity for you. Yeah. Help me help her help them. Um, where else can you find me on the internet? So I'm on Facebook, Dan, I'm sorry. Ugh. Ugh. <laughs> um, white okay. zone coaching on Facebook. Uh, I also have also a, a private Facebook group where I'm, I'm, coaching kids. I'm putting my drills and skills into that, uh, into that Facebook group. I'm also hosting a bunch of different classes with them, a bunch of different group training, uh, group practices like strength and conditioning and mental mindset Mondays. I love that Mondays. Um, and of course hitting, pitching, catching, I'm doing those sessions, uh, with them in that group. And then whitezonecoaching.com, even though it's not live right now, because I had to fix it, uh, that will be up. So whitezonecoaching.com, that should be up hopefully by the end of this weekend, fixed and all pretty again. 
Sounds good. All right. Well, I'll put all the links to all that stuff in the, the show description. So whether that's on YouTube uh, or here on iTunes and Spotify, once the, the replay goes live either later tonight or tomorrow. So um, if you're looking for, if you're listening to this, not live, then you'll be able to find those links there. And I'll put some uh, real quick here in Twitter, right. When we're done. So Amanda, this was a great talk. Um, yeah, Bobby you. and I really appreciate having you on there. I know we didn't cover everything, but yeah. um, maybe we'll have you on here again. No doubt. I'd love I that. Also I also have a softball so. podcast. So there's that. <laughs> we'll have to have you on so I can be on video. Obviously the people I was checking the uh, Periscope messages, it's a couple dozen people asking where I was at at least. That's nice. not true. That's fake news. <laughs> Just maybe one. Maybe one. That's it right. was me. That's right. Periscope's still a thing. I don't know why it exists. It's like Twitter's way to put stuff on the web. It, it's strange. I don't understand it. Just like make it part of Twitter. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you're out there listening, thank you so much for being here. Hopefully you made it here to the end. There is the two hour mark. Yes. Um, be sure to follow Amanda and check out the summit. And um, Bobby, send us out. It was fun. We'll see everybody next Tuesday when I'll be back in video. So you definitely want to tune in for that. Yep, Bobby will be back. All right, thanks, and we'll see you soon.